50 years ago next week, on the 6th of October 1973, the most powerful and well-equipped air forces in the Middle East went to war. For nearly three weeks, the Egyptian and Syrian air forces, backed by the USSR, threw everything they had at the IDF AF, supported by the USA. This was a conflict that neither Israel nor the US expected to occur. In 1967, the Israeli Air Force had essentially eliminated both the Egyptian and Syrian Air Forces on the opening day of the Six-Day War. Over 450 aircraft were destroyed, including most of the modern MiG-21 and MiG-19s owned by the Egyptian military. The humiliation also affected the morale and leadership of those air forces. Many of the most experienced senior officers were removed from their positions as scapegoats, even though the fundamental errors were intelligence and political. Operation Focus remains a case study in preemptive strikes and is a tribute to the skill of the IDAF AF. It was not, however, as much as a reflection on the competence and skills of the Egyptian and Syrian aviators and commanders as the historical record would suggest. Israel, and indeed the Soviet Union and USA, concluded that the humiliation in 1967 would take at least a decade to recover from. And, without the possibility of establishing air superiority, there was no possibility of an Arab army defeating the Israelis on the ground. This view about the fundamental ability of Arab air forces to challenge the IDAF-AF in air-to-air combat was reinforced in the War of Attrition that ground on between 1967 and 1973. Over a hundred Egyptian and Syrian aircraft were lost in this period, versus only a few dozen Israeli. In their minds of observers, the losses of materiel and personnel further depleted the ability and will of those countries to wage an air war. Their predictions were wrong. While it is true that at the end of September 1973 the Egyptian Air Force was not in the ideal shape to take on the IDAF AF, it was not a basket case. It was commanded by Mohammed Ali Fami, a former armour officer who would prevail over President Nasser to make the Egyptian Air Force independent from the army in the aftermath of the 1967 war. It was his strategy that would underpin the 1973 conflict. Egypt had about 290 fast jet pilots available at the outset of the conflict. Some of these, particularly in the MiG-21 community, had been blooded in combat in the War of Attrition and, to some extent, in 1967. They also had 220 pilots in training. The quality of that training was an issue for the Egyptians and a major bone of contention with the Soviet Union. As with many countries who were either backed by the Soviets or were their customers, the USSR took on responsibility of training pilots for their air forces. This made a lot of sense in the two decades after the Second World War, as many countries obtained their independence from imperial powers and found themselves without much of the military infrastructure and experience they needed to support an advanced military. Even providing a basic syllabus to train pilots is hard enough. Preparing them to deliver weapons in a combat situation is very hard and requires experienced instructors with the right mindset to teach as well as the money to supply the training material and replace losses. Preparing a flight or squadron with the coordination and tactics they need for a single engagement is a whole other level of difficulty. And, to perhaps labour the point, this is in itself nothing next to the complexity of creating the right infrastructure to maintain a high sortie rate, position aircraft at the right point on the ground or in the sky at the right moment, repair battle damage, and so on. Egyptian aviators were initially trained by a ragtag bunch of former RAF pilots, but this support ended in the build-up to Suez. The Soviets filled the gap, but the quality of training their pilots received was not particularly high. Egyptian pilots were shipped to Russia or the Ukraine for a year, but this time really only took them from having basic flight training to a stage at which they could take off, land and basically control MiGs and Su's. They arrived back in their squadrons without any knowledge about how to fight those jets. Egyptian veterans also observed that the Soviet pilot instructors and the advisors they sent back to Egypt with the products had no actual combat experience. They were textbook warriors, small piece parts in a war machine that hadn't actively engaged an enemy since the early 1950s. 
The knock-on effect of this was that the Egyptian frontline squadrons were forced to suspend their own advanced training needs to educate hundreds of new recruits. In fact, they learned most from a small contingent of Pakistani veterans from the war with India, who taught their elite Black Eagle squadron how to master the MiG-21 as a dogfighter. This caused further friction with the Soviets, who basically didn't believe that their own aircraft could perform in the low-speed domain the way the Pakistanis demonstrated. Egypt had also been pressing the Soviets for access to the machinery and production lines that it needed to build and maintain its MiGs and Sukhois locally. This logistical point is important as Egypt was dependent on Warsaw Pact countries for significant repairs and deep overhauls. The LZR-2 works in Poland was particularly important for this. Any serious battle damage received by an aircraft in conflict would mean that it was written off for the duration. These various issues, alongside their role in triggering a coup against Sadat, caused a split with the USSR in 1971. Although repaired to the extent that deliveries of weapons resumed in late 1972, the relationship was tense and the Egyptian Air Force did not feel that it had sufficient access to the cutting edge of Soviet aircraft in the build-up to war that victory was likely. Even so, they could call on substantial resources in the coming conflict. Foremost amongst these were around 180 active MiG-21s consisting of five versions. Most modern were MiG-21 MFs. These were very powerful warplanes, superior to everything in the Israeli inventory besides the Phantom. The major upgrades they carried were the RP-22 fire control radar and a computerized gun sight. They also reintroduced internal guns to the MiG-21, in the form of a single 23mm GSH-23L. The new avionics setup did allow them to fire the AA-8 AFID air-to-air missile, a substantial upgrade against the R-3S Atoll. Four of these could be carried, but Egypt had none available and was therefore limited to the Atoll. A more powerful engine was also fitted, which was necessary as the MiG-21 MF was somewhat heavier than its forebears. Thrust to weight ratio and thus acceleration was impressive. Range was not. 20 MFs had been delivered and around 16 remained. More numerous were second generation MiG 21 PFMs and PFS. These had the original MiG 21 engine, could carry a cannon in an under fuselage pod, and featured the RP 21M radar. This was also a relatively crude set really only suitable for close-range scanning for and detection of targets in bad weather. The PFS was essentially the same as the PFM with some changes such as blown flaps and a braking parachute, which reduced the takeoff and landing rolls. It is hard to assess how many of these were available, but I think it was around 100. The ubiquitous MiG-21 F-13 and FL made up the remainder of the fleet. The former are the familiar, basic, first-generation MiG-21, armed with a 30mm cannon with 60 rounds and two R3S infrared homing missiles. Apparently this was the favoured version of the aircraft for Egypt's elite pilots, as its supreme manoeuvrability was much more useful than the supposedly more advanced avionics of the later upgraded versions. Somewhere around 70 of these remained serviceable in 1973. The FL was the all-weather interceptor version of the original MiG-21. To that end, it carried a more advanced radar that, even downgraded for export, did allow detection of fighter-sized targets at about 5 kilometers. The cost of this was losing the internal gun and adding quite a lot of weight. Although it had its uses as part of a ground-controlled interception system, the FL was the least useful of the MiG-21s available to the Egyptians. Its radar and engine were downgraded versus the Soviet PF model, and it lacked the ability to fire semi-active radar homing missiles. It was therefore limited to atolls, and thus had very little capability unless it could be guided into a favourable position for an ambush by ground control. Egypt had fewer than 10 of these, so they were not likely to play a major role in any case. Around 20 MiG-21s were in storage, these could potentially be used for spare parts, but reactivating them wasn't realistic at short notice. After the MiG-21 MFs, the next most sophisticated aircraft available to the Egyptian Air Force were 16 Su-17s and 14 Su-20 fitters. 
The successor to the Su-7, which Egypt also operated, the Su-17 is a big, tough and powerful aircraft. Predominantly a ground attack plane, the fitter did have some utility as a fighter. It was very fast, particularly at low level where it could easily punch past Mach 1. It carried two hard-hitting 30mm cannons and could launch ATOL and AFID missiles. On the downside, its large size and relatively small wing area made it quite cumbersome in a turning fight. Even so, when well flown, it represented a threat to all IAF aircraft, including the Phantom. As I mentioned, the EAF also had a fleet of Su-7s. The numbers of these aircraft available in 1973 is quite often overstated. Over 180 had been delivered from 1967 to 1972, although the fleet suffered high attrition in accidents and in combat during the War of Attrition. I believe that the most reliable estimate for the number of serviceable aircraft is around 50. The Su-7 was much more limited than either the MiG-21 or the Su-17 as an air superiority fighter. Although it also had a very powerful engine, it was large and carried only the 30mm cannon for air-to-air -air use. More crippling to its effectiveness in a major conflict was its lack of range, only a few hundred miles at combat weight and at combat speed, and its high landing and takeoff speeds which demanded a very long and very vulnerable runway. EAF pilots didn't like the Su-7 and their leaders were unenthusiastic when the Soviets kept offering them more. Inevitably, the MiG-17 remained in significant service with the EAF, particularly in a ground attack role. Around 100 MiG-17Fs were available at one time, alongside a handful, literally four or five, MiG-17PF all-weather interceptors. By 1973, these were seen as ground attack aircraft to be covered by the MiG-21s, but, of course, the MiG-17 remained a formidable dogfighter for any pilot foolish enough to descend into its envelope at low altitudes and speeds below 400 knots. Over a hundred armed L-29 trainers acted as an emergency reserve of light attack aircraft. These had essentially no use as air-to-air -air fighters against the IAF, and lack of pilots meant that realistically only 20 to 30 would actually be able to supplement other tactical fighters. There were also four Soviet-owned MiG-25s in deep storage in Cairo. These were definitely not available for combat, but would have been an interesting addition to the Egyptian forces if they had been. For completeness, I'll mention the 24 Tu-16 medium bombers and 20 Beagle light bombers that acted as strategic support for the tactical aircraft. The former were definitely very useful. The latter had proved to be death traps in the 1967 war and were really only for emergency use. Another interesting quirk that sometimes gets overlooked is that the Egyptian Air Force had two contingents of non-Soviet fighters at its bases in October 1973. Arguably the most capable ground attack aircraft in its whole inventory were 19 Libyan MiG-5Bs. These were on long-term loan and had provided a very useful opportunity for dissimilar training, which the Egyptians and Syrians had taken advantage of during 1973. Using them against the IAF was complicated as they were also an operator of the type. A group of Egyptian pilots were trained on the Mirages, but supplies and ammunition for them were limited as the French aircraft required rather different supply chains than the Soviet aircraft in Egypt's inventory. The D model also lacked the ability to fire air-to-air -air missiles, although it did have an internal gun. There were also 20 Iraqi Hawker Hunters at Egyptian bases. These two were decent fighters, superior to the very tired MiG-17s in most respects. The Iraqi aviators were the cream of that air force, well trained and well motivated, but the Hunter was primarily used as a ground attack aircraft. In total, the Egyptian air force could muster about 360 tactical fighters, of which 210 were relatively modern types. It is, however, important to recognise that the Egyptian aircraft were not equipped with the latest Soviet avionics or missiles, which would be a crucial disadvantage in the coming conflict. Even so, the EAF order of battle was not to be underestimated. The Syrian Air Force in 1973 was very much smaller and less capable than the Egyptian. 
Although they had upgraded their bases since 1967, the rebuilding of the actual fighter inventory had proceeded relatively slowly and was impeded by frequent clashes with the IDAF-AF during the War of Attrition, and less fractious links with the USSR from 1967 to 1973, which in turn meant that the Soviets were more willing to expedite delivery of aircraft both to replace losses and bolster the SYAAF. To that end, they received dozens of MiG-21s in 1973, building the fleet back to 108 examples, made up of 47 of the latest MiG-21 MFs, 42 PFMs and PFSs, and 19 F-13s. Around 15 examples were in reserve. 15 Su-20s were also available, although they had only arrived in mid-September and were therefore probably not fully operational. A handful of Su-7s made up the balance of the supersonic fighter contingent. Around 60 MiG-17Fs and a small number of MiG-15 UTI trainers and L-29s formed the balance of the Syrian fighter force. The total number of tactical fighters available was therefore somewhere between 180 and 200 on October 6, 1973. As with the Egyptian Air Force, the issues for the Syrian military were not really the available airframes, but the number of experienced pilots available to them and the quality of the Soviet weapons that the fighters were armed with. Syria had been less organised than Egypt in its pilot recruitment and training. Whereas the EAF got its pilots through that training programme in two years, the Syrians took three. Although there were enough pilots for all of the fast jets on the eve of the war, these pilots were generally not fully trained in all mission types. Night and bad weather flying were particular deficiencies, as was close air support. One area that they were experienced in was air-to-air -air combat. Like the Egyptians, they had benefited from Pakistani instructors. They also retained a healthy independent streak when it came to tactical formations, which frustrated the Soviet instructors determined to teach them about GCI. Syria had some geographical similarities to Vietnam. It was a relatively small country with rugged terrain that served to confuse look-down radars. The VPAF's tactics of boom and zoom would likely be highly effective if GCI could be trained and pilots were willing to fly to instructions. Neither of these things were a given, but certainly some lessons did sink in. Another advantage that the Syrian pilots enjoyed was effectively unlimited live firing practice with the R-3S missile. The performance of these weapons had been so poor in the war of attrition that the Soviets sought to fix the problem through training and a large supply of the missiles. This is actually an important point to make about the Syrian air force. From the Israeli vantage point, the Syrians were poor pilots flying poor airplanes. This belief derived from the high kill ratio that the IDAF-AF had enjoyed in the years since 1967. The Syrian pilots had a contrary view and their morale remained high. What was in fact happening was that Syrian pilots were often able to manoeuvre to set up a killing shot, only to have their missiles malfunction or to lack the internal cannon required to finish the job. They were an aggressive, headstrong group of aviators who were willing to take risks that even the Egyptians thought were crazy but they certainly did not lack technical skill or motivation, and they too benefited from flying against the Libyan mirages in training. The task for the Egyptian and Syrian air forces was daunting. A raid against them was the best equipped force in the region and one that had engaged in an extensive programme of rearmament in the six years since 1967. The centrepiece of this programme was a force of 103 F4E Phantom IIs, delivered in a series of phases known, optimistically, as Peace Echo, in part in barter for access to captured MiG-17s and MiG-21s that had been exploited in the Have Drill, Have Ferry and Have Donut projects. These were, to put it simply, the best air-to-air -air fighter in the world in 1973. Amongst the extensive upgrades the E carried over the C and D models was the fitment of an internal M61 Vulcan cannon, which gave the Phantom the ability to strike from 15 miles with sparrows, a few miles with sidewinders, and right down to a few hundred metres with the cannon. Around 90 of the big Phantoms were operational at any one time. Their crews were well trained and battle hardened. The other air to air fighter in the Israeli inventory were French Dassault Mirages. 
The original fleet of Mirage 3s that had led the force in 1967 had been worn down over years of fighting and accidents. Around 40 of these remained serviceable, of which all had the temperamental radar replaced with ballast to simplify maintenance. Half of the fleet had been upgraded with ATAR 9C engines, increasing reliability. Although France had imposed sanctions on Israel in the wake of the Six-Day War, the IDAF-AF had nevertheless managed to secure knockdown kits from France to assemble 51 Mirage 5s. These were known as IAA Neshers and because of the embargo featured some Israeli-made avionics and were assembled with US help. As a package, they were somewhat less capable than the Mirage 3s, but they were reliable and a well-known weapon system. Both the Phantoms and Mirages were multi-role fighters and were intended to be used as such. The bulk of the ground attack role was, however, the responsibility of a fleet of A-4 Skyhawks. 165 of these were in service in 1973, in multiple variants. Although the A-4 was armed with cannons and could carry Sidewinder, its air-to-air capabilities were primarily defensive. The same was true of the remaining Super Mystere B-2s. 20 overhauled versions of this first-generation fighter remained in service in October 1973. Having destroyed the Arab air forces in 1967 and defeated the Syrians and Egyptians in the War of Attrition, the IDAF-AF believed that it had total superiority over them in terms of technology and personnel. Israeli pilots typically have between four and five as many hours in their aircraft than their Arab counterparts. Their tactics have been honed over 25 years of constant fighting without significant defeat. Essentially, Israeli doctrine called for a repeat of 1967 a massive preemptive strike to destroy the majority of the enemy air force on the ground. This would be followed up by elaborate ambushes to destroy any remaining fighters while the majority of the air force acted as flying artillery to support the ground forces. These assumptions would be unwound in the first days of the new war. It was the ability of the experienced IDF-AF to adapt that would be tested the most. Air-to-air munitions were a crucial area of superiority for the IDAF-AF. The only available air-to-air missile available to Egyptian and Syrian pilots was the venerable Vimple R3S Atoll. This weapon had proved somewhat effective for the VPAF in Vietnam, but the tactical situation in the Middle East was very different. Highly effective GCI and restrictive rules of engagement that prevented the USAF properly suppressing North Vietnamese radar sites and bases meant that MiG-21s were generally able to launch their missiles in high-speed ambushes. This got around a critical issue with the Atoll, that it had to be fired from the opponent's rear quarter, ideally with positive Delta Mac and from below. It also had to be fired when the launching aircraft was pulling 2G or less. Its usefulness in a dogfight against experienced aviators flying aircraft with equivalent ability in an energy fight was marginal. IDAF-AF fighters all carried either AIM-9D Sidewinders or the indigenous Shafir-2. These were also rear-aspect homing missiles that had a significantly wider useful envelope, were faster and had longer ranges than the Atoll which was essentially a copied AIM-9B but with reduced reliability due to lower manufacturing tolerances. The table gives you a sense of just how superior the AIM-9D and Shafir-2 were over the Atoll. I've also included the AIM-9G as it was supplied to the IDF over the course of the conflict. The G was the best AAM in the world at that time and would prove to be lethal. Phantom pilots had a further advantage as they also carried four AIM-7E Sparrows. These missiles were complex beasts, but some of their reliability issues had been ironed out since 1965, and maintenance standards were good in the IDAF-AF. Unimpeded by rules of engagement, Israeli aviators could employ the Sparrow at ranges up to 15 miles in a head-on attack, well outside the gun range of an Arab fighter. Interviews with Syrian pilots suggest that IDF-AF pilots were not particularly adept with the Sparrow, as very few rounds ever found their targets. And for reference, the Sparrow kill ratio in Vietnam was just 8%. The Phantom's other advantage was that it carried 8 missiles and a gun by default. 
its ability to stay in a fight was exceptional compared to the MiG-21MF, which had a maximum of four atolls and its 23mm cannon. All fighters except the PF versions of the MiG-21 had internal cannons, and all except the MiG-17 had high-velocity rapid-fire types that were reasonably good for air-to-air -air use. Soviet gun sights, however, were not as good as those on Mirages or Phantoms, and the MiG-21 was a relatively poor gun platform. The Pippa was all over the shop when the cannons fired. Radar performance was a similar story. The Phantom's AN-APQ-120 was cutting edge and could pick out a fighter target at 40 miles or more. As I mentioned before, the best the MiG-21MF could do was more like 5 to 7 miles and the set was very vulnerable to jamming as the Israelis knew a lot about it. Comparing fighters is notoriously hard. I find that a useful starting point is with wing loading, which points to horizontal turning performance, and thrust to weight ratio that indicates how long a fighter can sustain a high G turn before airspeed drops too low and how effective the aircraft will be in vertical manoeuvres. This tells us something about the relative ease with which one pilot can obtain an advantageous position against another. Fights are, however, rarely started from equally advantageous positions. Being able to control the point at which an engagement is initiated is a crucial advantage. Although the Phantom is large and smoky relative to the MiG-21 or MiG-17, it has much better sensors, an extra pair of eyes to scan the sky, and greater all-round visibility than the MiG-21. The MiG-17 is about equal in situational awareness terms. Both of these aircraft and the SUs also suffered from poor cockpit layout that made them less easy to operate. The MiG-17 and Su-7 also had heavy controls and, as I've covered before, the MiG-17 could be tricky to control when diving and above 500 knots of indicated airspeed. Phantoms and Mirages were easy, predictable aircraft to fly. All of this makes it seem like I'm being very down on the Soviet aircraft. As air-to-air -air platforms, they were certainly cruder than the Phantom and Mirage and were designed to be an integrated part of a centrally controlled tactical system which both Syria and Egypt lack. Even so, they were good dogfighters. The MiG-21 was a good match for the latter and could trouble the former, but the quality of their weapons was deficient and reduced their effectiveness. Any Israeli pilot foolish enough to tangle with a MiG-17 low and slow would soon discover how exceptional its turning performance really was. Where the MiGs and Sukhois came into their own was in their ability to sustain high sortie rates. Because they were less complex, there was less to go wrong and it was easier to repair battle damage. Sadly for the Egyptians and Syrians, they lacked the industrial base and cadre of skilled maintainers needed to really exploit this advantage. The Soviet aircraft were also cheap. A MiG-21 was about a third of the price of a Phantom. Famously, they were cheaper to buy than a BMP-1. This was even more true of the Soviets were subsidising, which in this case they were for the Syrians, but not so much for the Egyptians. The combined Egyptian and Syrian air forces outnumbered the IDAF AF more than 2 to 1 in air superiority fighters. So these were the forces arrayed against each other in the early days of October 1973. A resurgent, but in many critical ways underprepared Egypt and Syria, against a battle-hardened and well-equipped IDAF-AF, but one that had fundamentally miscalculated its enemy's strength. The outcome of the war is well known. The accepted wisdom about the air-to-air -air combat is, to my mind at least, not wholly correct.